just going to read you a few minutes of uh, boring stuff from this textbook. It's a textbook that I actually use in my real job pretty frequently. It's pretty useful. Handbook of Clinical Psychopharmacology. Handbook of Clinical Psychopharmacology for Therapists. So this is basically um, for therapists and psychologists who are not medically trained. It's like a um, need-to-know guide for psychopharmacology, so medication that's used for psychiatric issues. So it has a lot of nice big words and stuff like that, so I thought it'd be fun to read some to you. So I'll just flip open to a random page. I have mints in my mouth too, so I might hear a little bit of that going on. Okay, let's start down here. Specific receptors, receptor actions, drug effects, and side effects. The ideal psychiatric drug would be a highly selective molecule that would be targeted to bind to a specific receptor on specific nerve cells in the brain and have no effect on other receptors or neurons. It would also be administered in the most direct and convenient way possible for the patient. Such drugs do not exist. but are highly, highly sought after by pharmaceutical companies. Three major problems stand in the way of development of such ideal drugs. First, many molecules owing to their unique molecular shape inadvertently bind to more than one receptor. For example, a number of antipsychotics bind not only to the postsynaptic dopamine receptor, which creates dopamine blockade and presumably accounts for the antipsychotic effects, but also lock onto acetylcholine muscarinic receptors. This can result in a number of side effects, including memory impairment, blurry vision, and constipation, not to mention a few of the common anti anticholinergic side effects. The second problem is that a particular drug molecule, for example, binds to some dopamine receptors in the limbic system, producing desired antipsychotic effects. However, it simultaneously binds to other dopamine receptors, but they are located in the basal ganglia, and therefore it produces significant extrapyramidal side effects, such as tremors. Such molecules cannot be delivered to just one part of the brain and be sequestered there, but rather they're disseminated to numerous brain regions. The third problem is that among classes of receptors, numerous subtypes have been discovered and the drug molecules typically do not interact with one subtype. For example, currently 14 different serotonin receptors have been identified drugs that, in a global sense, increase brain serotonin levels have multiple effects since some serotonin receptors are inhibitory and some are excitatory. The pharmacologist may want to target serotonin, abbreviated 5-HT, 5-HT1A receptors to have an antidepressant effect but also can't help but activate all other 5-HT receptor subtypes, provoking numerous side effects. Thus, the development of highly selective molecules that potentially could target particular receptor subtypes and leave others alone is a dream and a challenge for many pharmaceutical company chemists. An important perspective for understanding medication effects and side effects requires a knowledge of various types of receptors that are found on the surface of particular nerve cells in the brain. It also requires becoming familiar with the assortment of actions that drugs can have on the receptors. Many hundreds of receptors have been identified, but a smaller and more manageable list of those most relevant to psychopharmacology are outlined below. Let's see, 
see I have a uh, post-it here. I'm curious what that's all about, so let's check it out. Oh, this was depressive disorders. I think I was looking into here uh, when I was writing my last book about depression to just verify some information that I was including in there. aforementioned data, coupled with numerous positive outcome studies of the effectiveness of antidepressants, has led to the development of the monoamine or biogenic amine hypothesis of depression. The theory holds that depressive symptoms are ushered in by a malfunction of norepinephrine, serotonin, and or dopamine neurons which play critical roles in the functioning of the limbic system and the adjacent hypothalamus. The basic neuronal malfunction is felt to be identical for norepinephrine, serotonin, or dopamine neurons. Interestingly, it is possible to transiently deplete these neurotransmitters using drugs and or manipulating diet to exclude certain amino acids. Yet most people who do not have a history of depression do not become clinically depressed. It is hypothesized that, neurotran that neurotransmitter depletion leads to depression only in the presence of a genetic predisposition to mood disorders. Recall the discussion in chapter 3 of normal chemical events at the level of the synapse. The monoamine hypothesis holds that several abnormalities may develop in norepinephrine, dopamine, or serotonin neurons in the brain. The first is excessive reuptake, see figure 6D. The effect of this abnormality is that significant amounts of neurotransmitter that have already been released from the presynaptic cell are rapidly reabsorbed. The result is decreased ability to stimulate postsynaptic receptors. The nerve cells, in a sense, are then unplugged. A second hypothesized malfunction involves decreased release of neurotransmitters into the synapse. This may be due to a reduction in the synthesis of the neurotransmitter and in an inability to adequately store neurotransmitters in vesicles and or abnormalities in the process of vesicle migration and the creation of transmembrane pores. A third way, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin cells can shut down is when the naturally occurring enzyme monoamine oxidase, MAO, becomes too active, excessively degrading neurotransmitters. This results in major depression, but often a depression with its own unique symptomatic signatures. See a typical depression above. A final type of cellular dysfunction may be traced to abnormalities in receptors. This might involve a shift in the absolute numbers of receptors or the ratio of inhibitory to excitatory receptors and or altered levels of receptor sensitivity, both of which can change the excitability levels of nerve cells. Such changes appear to be due to alterations in gene, alterations in gene expression which are likely to be secondary to the effects of second messengers. Which of the cellular changes appear first and how they interact is not fully understood. 
However, as those conditions come to affect thousands of norepinephrine, dopamine, or serotonin cells throughout the limbic system and hypothalamus, biologic rhythms such as sleep cycles and drives including hunger and sex get off track. Pleasure centers fail to respond. Anhedonia and emotional con control structures in the limbic system fail, resulting in lability or emotional discontrol. With time, the emergence of neurovegetative symptoms is seen. Without treatment, this abnormal condition can persist for many months, on average 6 to 18 months, and then it may begin to reestablish normal functioning. That is, the condition is often self-limiting, again for reasons that are not well understood. read a little bit about biologic theories for anxiety. Let's now explore the theories of biologic etiology. Hardwired into the nervous system of humans and many animals is a complex network of nerve pathways. Brain structures and glands that are responsible for eliciting the fight or flight response. This triggers a multi-level neurochemical and hormonal reaction designed to mobilize the body and mind during times of potential danger. Non-essential physiological processes shut down, such as digestion and reproduction, and energy is channeled into a host of bodily functions, preparing the organism for rapid action. The nervous system also shifts into a state of hyperarousal and vigilance. All of these changes, which occur rapidly and automatically, have evolved to assure survival when a person or animal confronts actual danger situations. Thus, fundamentally, the biologic mechanisms and processes underlying the fight-or-flight response are necessary and adaptive. The basic components of the fight or flight mechanism are depicted in are depicted schematically in figures 8b and 8c. As stressful events are perceived at the level of the cortex and are processed in a crude way on the subcortical level, the amygdala, lower brain areas become activated. In a sense, the limbic system is put on alert. Should ongoing precipitation result in oh sorry. Should ongoing perception result in a conclusion that there is imminent danger, a burst of excitation emanates from a cluster of nerve cell bodies in the brainstem called the locus ceruleus. The locus ceruleus has sometimes been called the adrenal gland of the brain. The locus ceruleus nerve cells which project to the limbic system are mediated by the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. The limbic system and adjacent hypothalamus shift into high gear, and by way of the pituitary gland and other downstream endocrine, endocrine glands, and the sympathetic nervous system, a multitude of stress hormones are released into the system. The brain and body alike are ready for action. It is also important to discuss yet another feature of the nervous system that plays a role in anxiety. On the surface of the majority of nerve cells in the brain, including cells in the locus ceruleus, a tiny gate, are tiny gateways referred to as chloride ion channels. See figure 8D. Chloride ions, which carry a slight negative charge, are in abundance in the fluid surrounding nerve cells. The ion channel can be activated, opened, when stimulated by the naturally occurring neurochemical gamma-aminobutyric acid, GABA for short. As the gate opens, the chloride ions are drawn in. When the nerve cell is infused with negative ions, its electrical characteristics are altered, resulting in a in decreased excitability. That's when it's hyperbolic hyperbolarized. 
This serves as a sort of biological braking mechanism serving to dampen limbic alert and calm overall brain excitation. Benzodiazepine molecules, the substance is found in anti-anxiety medications, also bind to the chloride ion channels, further enhancing the inflow of negative ions and thus producing a widespread calming in many areas of the brain. This model provides an understanding of the mechanism of action of anti-anxiety medications. It has also led to a theory that may explain some anxiety disorders. Since there is a receptor on the chloride ion channel that responds to benzodiazepine molecules, there is speculation that an endogenous benzodiazepine-like chemical may exist in the central nervous system. To date, however, such a chemical has yet to be identified, although some research believe that the adenosine may be the chemical. However, this sh this theory, should this theory hold true, it may provide an explanation for why some individuals are temperamentally more high-strung and less able to stay calm during stressful times, and why others experience chronic generalized anxiety. Such individuals may suffer from a deficiency of this yet-to-be-identified endogenous neurochemical. Excitability in the locus ceruleus is also mediated by serotonin. In this area of the brain, the serotonin receptors are inhibitory. Thus, any number of factors that lead to a global decrease in serotonin may affect the locus ceruleus, meaning it can become disinhibited and thus more sensitive to activation. Acquired fears appear to be mediated primarily by the amygdala. After exposure to very frightening events, the amygdala encodes certain stimulus elements of the experience. Such memories have been shown to be quite indelible, indelible and highly resistant to extinction. Once etched into the memory circuits of the amygdala, this brain structure develops a sort of persistent hypersensitivity to activation by simula similar stimuli. One result is that re-exposure to a simil similar anxiety-provoking event can result in ex insignificant or extreme reactivity. Also, generalization often occurs such that non-dangerous stimuli that, in, that somewhat resemble the original stressful event may readily provoke intense anxiety reactions. For example, the combat veteran who now experiences strong surges of anxiety when hearing a backfire from an automobile. There is speculation that serotonin also plays a role in inhibiting cellular reactivity in the amygdala. An serotonergenic, serotonergenic, serotonergic, and serotonergic antidepressants are now considered to be first-line treatments for many anxiety disorders. Okay, I'm going to find like one more section to read because as you can tell, my words are starting to fail me. It's getting late. So, this won't be the longest video ever, but... It's what I got time for. <laughs> so let me do a tiny bit more and then we'll uh, call it a night. Six, at least six major groups of antidepressants. Cyclic antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, NRIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, MAOIs, and the atypicals. In addition, Sometimes stimulants, such as Ritalin or Dexedrine, are used to de treat depression, and there are some reports of the use of Buspirone, Buspar. This 
despite our knowledge of some of the important mechanisms of actions for these medications, we still do not really know how they relieve depression. It is theorized that they start a process that leads to neuroendocrine effects, for example, decreased corticotropin releasing factor, or through intracellular second messengers to decreased brain-derived neurotropic factor, leading to improvement. Okay. So that's it for now. Um, I've done this a couple times before, just reading boring, you know, neurobiology stuff to you guys, but let me know if you'd like me to do more of this in the future. Um, it's actually helpful for me to brush up on this stuff anyway, so. Uh, I don't mind doing it at all. It's kind of double dipping. I had the thought as I was reading this as well that it would be cool to read some research papers um, because that's another thing that I would like to do is stay current on research in the field. But that's, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I do like this is not technically copyright sensitive. Like this is, I'm not supposed to be reading this for you you know, somebody's textbook, but I feel a little worse about individually published, you know, journal articles as well, but maybe some PubMed stuff or something that's publicly available, maybe even just reading some abstracts, because I can read those without going through the whole paper, and that would be okay to share, but I don't know. Let me know what you think. Have a good night or day or whatever time it is for you. I'll see you next time.